Welcome back, everyone. Jake here. Currently, we're on day 52 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and it's looking more likely that Russia is settling for more reasonable objectives with their war in Ukraine. And the reason why is because they're sustaining such heavy losses, heavy casualties. Now, this estimate is put out by Ukraine's defense ministry, but they're estimating that they've killed now over 20,000 Russian soldiers. This is not counting POWs, wounded in action, missing in action. This is potentially 20,000 dead in less than six weeks worth of fighting. And we know this is somewhat accurate because Ukraine has in their possession 7,000 unclaimed Russian soldiers' bodies. They're bringing in morticians and forensic ex experts from across Europe to help them identify bodies. But these are 7,000 corpses claimed from the field that they're trying to return to Russia, and Russia doesn't want them. And uh, Vladimir Putin on April 12th declared that they were going to achieve their noble objectives with their special military operation. And the speculation is, is that he's under political pressure to basically declare victory by May 9th. May 9th is uh, uh, you know, a holiday in Russia where they celebrate their victory in World War II. And Putin has always had this date in mind. Why he invaded in late February is because he wanted to wrap up the conflict, topple the government in Kyiv, get control of Ukraine, and then have a victory celebration by May 9th, celebrating bringing Ukraine back into the Russian Empire. So what is Putin's objective now that he's not going to be able to take the capital city, he's not going to be able to topple the government in Kyiv? This map is from March 29th, and it was at the end of March that the Russian military finally gave up on their invasion from the north. This map is from April 7th, where they completely pulled out of Cherniv, Bucha, Irpin, all of these cities in the north where we saw all of these war crimes and atrocities had been occurring under Russian occupation. And the theory is, is that all of these forces have been pulled back into Belarus, pulled back into Russia, and they're being swung around the border to the south to reinforce the forces down here. And potentially, Russia's new limited objective is to just control the Donbass region and the land bridge to Crimea. They're already in control of most of this territory. So here is the most recent war map put out by the BBC from the 13th of April. And you can see that Mariupol, unfortunately, has been completely surrounded, completely cut off. There might be a thousand or so Ukrainian forces still in the center of town, holding to the last man. And I just want to quick comment the, the heroism that these Ukrainian forces uh, down there are doing because by holding out, by not surrendering, they're tying up 15, 20,000 Russian forces who can't uh, pivot and start marching north until those forces have been destroyed or they've surrendered. So in Mariupol, they bought the Donbass region a lot of time. Uh, obviously, now that the north has been freed up, Ukraine is doing everything they can to rush supplies and rush troops down towards this region. So what the, the, the analysts are predicting now is that Putin needs a victory by May 9th. He's got about three weeks to pull this off. And all he's telling his military to do, potentially, on the ground, is to take this territory right here. There's about 40,000 Ukrainian forces dug in in defensive positions trying to hold this line in the Donbass region. But Vladimir Putin and the Russians don't even control all of the Luhansk Obelisk and the uh, Ob Oblast and the, uh, the Dunsk Oblast. So they've taken Kurzon and this southern land bridge, but they don't even control the two territories that they're stating to their people, this is why we invaded. So by May 9th, uh, Vladimir Putin wants these Oblasts completely taken. Potentially, I know there's a, a nuclear power plant here uh, near uh, uh, near the Dnieper River. So if he can just slice here and cut off these forces, eradicate them, get control of this land, 
he might try on May 9th to declare a unilateral peace and say, this war is over, we achieved our objectives, Ukraine, stop fighting us. Now, you can't do that. You can't just declare a unilateral peace once you have what you want. That doesn't guarantee the Ukrainians will stop fighting. But Russia will say, just let us keep what we've taken and this war is over. But I don't think Zelensky and the Ukrainians are going to settle for that. So the Ukrainians know that Putin and Russia are taking heavy losses and they're under a political timetable to show their objective. So all they have to do is play defense. They just have to stall and uh, basically clog up these ground forces and prevent them from achieving their political objective by May 9th. And all they have to do is aggregate, frustrate, and demoralize the Russian forces, and eventually their political will to continue this fight will collapse. And Ukraine scored a huge victory by sinking the Black Sea flagship. It's called the, the Moskva. And this is a $700 million warship with a crew of about 600 sailors. Apparently, when this thing went down, the captain wouldn't abandon the ship, so he drowned, and the captain of this ship uh, went down with his ship. And uh, this ship is pretty famous because this is the ship on the commemorative stamp of that event on Snake Island where the Ukrainian forces told the warship to go F off rather than uh, surrender the island. And this, this, this sinking, guys, is the biggest naval combat loss in 40 years. You have to go back to uh, the Falkland Wars 40 years ago to find the last time a vessel of a comparable size and prestige was sunk by enemy forces. And how did the Ukrainians sink it? They're claiming that they sunk it with this R-360 Neptune missile that entered service in the Ukrainian Navy in March of 2021. So it was very kind of Russia to wait eight years after taking Crimea to invade the country so they could have enough time to develop this missile and get it into service. Now, of course, Russia is denying that Ukraine successfully sunk this ship. They're saying that a fire broke out on board, and that's why the ship sank. But the old saying is, don't believe it's true until Russia denies it. I've really been enjoying the memes online about the sinking of the ship. This one is, they tried installing one of those goofy cope cages on top of the ship, didn't protect it from getting hits. This one, heroic cruiser Moskva, Promoted a submarine, uh, that's Russia's spin on the events. And then lots and lots of battleship references uh, between Zelensky and Putin going on. But on a very serious note, this ship more than likely did have nuclear weapons on board, and those weapons are now at the bottom of the Black Sea. So at some point in the future, Russia or the international community is going to have to do uh, a search and recover operation for these very dangerous weapons. Next piece of bad news for Russia is that Finland and Sweden now want to join uh, NATO. Finland is being more honest and vocal about their intentions, but I think if Finland joins, Sweden will also join, and they're going to decide this potentially this summer. This is going to be an automatic yes for NATO because they already meet the qualifications. And if Russia's objective was to not have NATO on their border, then invading Ukraine, yeah, is going to cause uh, pressure or interest in countries like Finland to get that guarantee, get that security. The only reason why NATO is not helping Ukraine is because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So that is why Finland feels like they need this security guarantee. Russia is threatening their neighbors right now with nuclear weapons. And Finland, to my knowledge, doesn't have nuclear weapons, but if they were to join NATO, they could then start hosting NATO forces or even NATO nuclear weapons, which would cause a deterrence and prevent Russia from attacking them. But this border you see right here is 800 miles. Uh, St. Petersburg obviously is very important to Russia, and it's only about 30 miles from the Finnish border. So by invading Ukraine, Russia's stated objectives of uh, stopping NATO expansion, they're failing in every respect. 
Next, I want to talk to you guys about uh, MiG-29s potentially being given to Ukraine by Slovakia. And this is an interesting story because Poland had this idea over a month ago. They wanted to donate their MiG-29 fighters to Ukraine and then get some kind of guarantee that those planes would be replaced either by NATO or the United States, get F-16s or whatever. And at the time, over a month ago, the Pentagon shot down that idea. They didn't want to escalate the war by giving Ukraine, uh, you know, warplanes. But the Pentagon seems okay with this. Now, there's not been any kind of guarantee to Slovakia that they'll be given uh, Western planes if they give up their old Soviet-age MiG-29s. But this is still basically a, a changing position by NATO and Western countries that as Russia continues to escalate and commit war crimes, the um, basically what they deem acceptable as far as giving more deadly we weapons to the Ukrainians, they're no longer concerned about how Russia is going to react to it. They're just going to do it now. Here is a convoy of tanks leaving Poland uh, for, for, for Ukraine. <laughs> So we got APCs and artillery guns, and the Ukrainian forces know this. Once again, going back to the map, they know that they just have to dig in and build defensive positions, that Russia is going to attack them the next two weeks with basically an all-out full frontal attack, similar to what they did in the north that caused heavy casualties. So it's a race against time now. The Ukrainians don't have to worry about reclaiming any any land in the next month they just need to build defensive positions and wait for this ill-advised attack to come from russia the united states is also rushing in another hundred million dollars worth of military aid i think they've already given about three or four billion dollars and this article tells you exactly what is going in uh, we got 500 javelin missiles uh let's see 30,000 sets of body armor and helmets, uh, claymores. We got uh, 155 millimeter howitzers with 40,000 40, artillery rounds. Absolutely insane. And what we're going to talk about in a second here are these switchblade kamikaze drones because this truly is a game changer in, in modern warfare. So let's, uh, let's, actually, let's actually go do that right now. Here is a news clip from NBC that was actually filmed in December of last year. So this was filmed before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. But let's watch the first 40 seconds of this news clip about these kamikaze switchblade drones. Amid the quiet beauty of the Utah desert, a deadly new kind of weapon on display. NBC News got an exclusive look at a so-called killer drone. Yeah, so it doesn't fire a missile. It is the missile. This is about the size of a toy drone I bought my 12-year-old a few years ago. The switchblade can be carried into battle in a backpack and launched miles away from a threat. Once a target is identified, the switchblade can find it and kill it in minutes. Watching! Aero Vironment, the drone's manufacturer, showed us how an operator starting up turn. can put a switchblade through the window of a truck. Onboard cameras capture the moment before impact. How far away was the switchblade when it took that picture? Uh, about three meters from the target. At about $6,000 each, the switchblade costs a fraction of the $150,000 Hellfire missiles fired from larger military drones. So there are two sizes of these kamikaze switchblade drones. There's the 300 model and the 600 model. The 300 has been around for about 10 years. It actually was used by special forces in Afghanistan. But the new one is the 600 that just went into operation. Let's watch a little bit of this news clip as well. The switchblade drone, sometimes called the kamikaze, was developed for US special forces in Afghanistan and introduced in 2011. Tired of waiting for air support, American troops wanted a drone they could carry in their backpacks and use instantly to take out targets from above. 
The original Switchblade, now known as the Switchblade 300, is just over half a metre long and weighs less than three kilos. Three, two, one. It has a range of 10 kilometres and a loitering time of 15 minutes. It is designed to attack personnel and light vehicles. In March, the Biden administration promised to send 100 tactical unmanned aerial systems to Ukraine as part of an $800 million military aid package. Each of these systems are thought to carry 10 switchblade drones, which would give a total of 1,000 in all. At the start of April, the US revealed this offer would also include 10 of the larger tank-busting switchblade 600. Although these are still manned portable and can be set up in just 10 minutes, at 23 kilograms they're significantly heavier. With that increase in size comes additional power. The Switchblade 600 is designed to fly out to 40 kilometers in 20 minutes, then loiter for another 20 minutes, giving it a total range of 80 kilometers. It attacks at 185 kilometers an hour. So there are two sizes of these Kamikaze Switchblade drones. The smaller one is about five pounds, can fit in your backpack and you launch it potentially up to 10 kilometers away. It can fly and loiter in the air for 15 minutes, and they only cost $6,000. They have the firepower basically of a hand grenade, so it's not gonna take out a tank, uh, but it can blow up a window, or it can hit the passenger cab of a vehicle. Probably could take out a fuel truck as well. Now, the larger one, the Switchblade 600, this thing can fly for 40 minutes. It does weigh 50 pounds, so it's a little bit harder to get around, but it has inside of it basically a Javelin missile. And these things can destroy armored vehicles, tanks or, or whatever. And when they uh, acquire their targets, uh, you can then set it to kill. It dive bombs at about 150 miles per hour. So. The, this technology, guys, is terrifying because how do you counter this? Aside from just parking all of your vehicles and living completely underground, how do you protect yourself from these drones? They're you know, on radar, basically showing up as the size of birds. Let's take a deeper look here with another video about this Switchblade 600. Because the 300 has been around for a while, but these tank-busting... Kamikaze drones, uh, the 600 series, only became operational basically a year and a half ago. So what's happening, I think, is the United States military is giving Ukraine a limited number of these, only about 100, and they're saying, test them for us, check them out, uh, give us the data back, and if they're successful, we'll just start printing these things uh, and send you, send you thousands of them. So let's take, a, let's take a closer look at the Switchblade 600. This all-in-one man portable solution includes everything required to successfully launch, fly, track, and engage non-line-of-sight targets with lethal effects. It can be set up and operational in less than 10 minutes, and its lightweight tube launch system allows for the flexibility to be launched from ground, air, or mobile platforms, providing superior force overmatch while minimizing exposure to enemy direct and indirect fires. It's equipped with a high performance EO IR gimbal and precision flight control delivers over 40 minutes of endurance. 600 delivers unprecedented tactical reconnaissance, surveillance and target acquisition at standoff range with a range of over 40 kilometers. And when the time is right to prosecute a target with a precision strike, 600 delivers with enhanced lethal effects at over 150 mile an hour dash speed, it gets there quick. I like that terminology, when it's time to prosecute, prosecute a target. So think about it, guys. If, if the United States and the West can just manufacture thousands and thousands of these kamikaze drones, and then just daily start launching them in, Ukrainian forces don't have to put themselves at risk. This thing has a 40 minute flight time with a total 80 kilometer range. So even if Russia pulls out of all the territory they took because they just can't sustain this barrage anymore of these cheaply made kamikaze drones, you know, Crimea is now a target. The, the border <clears throat> between Ukraine and Russia going 80 kilometers deep is, is now a target. And they have, 
I think the United States themselves is a little uh, paranoid about this technology becoming widely understood, widely adapted. Uh, obviously, some of these drones are going to fall into Russia's hands. They'll make it to China. And this is a new this is a new generation of warfare where we can just create bombs on smart guided drones that can just fly indefinitely. I mean, this is just the first generation of these kinds of kamikaze drones. What are they going to think up of and develop potentially 10 years from now? They could put solar panels on these things and have a drone, a kamikaze drone fly potentially for hundreds of miles during the day. Like there's so much you could do with this next level of technology. So I just, I don't think Russia's prepared. I don't think Russia sees this coming. And if they don't pull out and admit this was a huge mistake soon, uh, what is coming is tens of thousands of these kamikaze drones being flooded into Ukraine and then launched on Russian forces. And there's nothing Russia can do that I can think of to counter these in the short term. Okay, everyone, that's all for this update video. If you found it informative, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. If you have any comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.